up to this point, all of our differential equations have been first order. But we need to go past that. One of the big reasons is Newton's third law. That says force equals mass times acceleration. But from calculus, we know that acceleration is the second derivative of position. So that means we're going to need to consider equations of second order, at least. And these are really common. So in addition to motion applications, uh, a lot of electrical applications, uh, diffusion is a second order derivative in space instead of in time, and there are many other examples as well. And here's a generic second order ODE. x double prime is a function of t, x, and x prime. A well-known example is the pendulum. So if we have a pendulum of length L, it makes an angle of theta with the vertical. And there's a mass M that exerts a weight at the end. Then we have theta double prime plus a friction coefficient gamma times theta prime plus g over l times sine theta equals zero. There's an important fact that it turns out that we can exchange order of an equation for more dimensions. So here's our second order problem again. I'm going to define a vector whose components are the variables x and x prime. Then u1 prime is x prime, but that's what we called u2. And u2 prime is x double prime, but that comes from the differential equation f of t x x and x prime, and we called x u1 and x prime u2. When we put this together, we have two differential equations, one for u1 and one for u2. They're coupled together, but they don't make any references to x anymore. They stand on their own. And this is an equivalent first order system of equations. Instead of a scalar second order equation, we have a first order equation in two dimensions. Here's our pendulum equation again. So I'll define u1 as theta and u2 as theta prime. u1 prime is theta prime. By definition, that's u2. u2 prime is theta double prime, and that we can fill in using the original differential equation by solving for theta double prime. That's negative gamma theta prime minus g over L sine theta. And then we convert those into u's. If we leave out the middle parts, then everything is expressed in terms of the u's. And we have a system. u prime is a function of t and u. Actually, the t doesn't even appear explicitly. And u is the vector, again, of theta and theta prime, which we, exact, we, could, which we could call the state of the pendulum. If you just take a picture of a pendulum, that's not enough information. You also need to know its velocity in order to know the whole state. So there's a physical significance here as well.
The conversion from a second order equation to a first order system is important not just for our formulas and, and theory, it's also usually an important step in a numerical solution as well. Most numerical software is written to solve first order problems. And if you have a higher order problem, you have to convert it yourself into a first order form. So here again is the pendulum equation as a second order equation. And then here's the conversion into a first order system in two dimensions. So to keep things simple, I'm going to have this gamma constant as 0, and I'll set g over l equal to 1. And then I'm going to solve an ODE, so I need to define the function that gives me du dt. du dt is going to be defined now as a function of t and u, but u is now a vector variable. And the result, du dt, also has to be a vector. For this stuff, MATLAB really wants, col really wants column vectors. So that's why this is going to be shaped as a column vector with the brackets and a semicolon. The first component of du dt is just u2. That comes from this first equation. The second component, u2 prime, comes from this. And there's u2 prime. All right, and we could define this in a separate file if we wanted to, but it's so small here, we can just do it right in line. Now I'll define t to go from 0 to 20. My initial condition is an initial condition on the vector u. So let me first do it with a small angle. So I'm going to hold the angle at 0.5, and then it'll be at rest, and then I let it go. And then the rest of this is I'm going to solve the ODE and plot it. All right. And the solution looks a lot like a cosine. The blue is U1. And a, a sine or a negative sine, that's the red, which is U2. If you like, you can also think of these as theta and theta prime. So when the pendulum is at maximum deflection, the velocity is momentarily zero. Right? That makes sense. And when the pendulum is at the down position, the velocity is at a maximum or a minimum value. Again, that makes physical sense. Now this output from the ODE solver, u, it's got 500 rows and two columns. So each row represents a different time, and each column represents a different component. So the solution has two components. They're the two columns. Another way of plotting the solution is to take the first component on the x-axis, that's the first column, and the second component on the y-axis. And this is called a phase plot or a state plot. And it looks an awful lot like a circle. Now you may know for small angles, we can say, we can use the approximation that sine theta is nearly theta. And then this is a linear equation. But if I use a large angle, let's say I give it a large initial angle, You see, we get a solution that looks very different. And in the phase plane, you get this well-known sort of eye shape developing. Here's an animation of the solution of the pendulum. If you've ever been on the pirate ship ride in an amusement park, you know that it spends most of the time up near the top. The reduction from order to dimension works for any equations. So here I have a third and a second order equation. 
The first step is to identify the highest derivative in each of the variables. The x triple prime tells me that I need to include x, x prime, and x double prime. And the y double prime tells me I need y and y prime. Everything up to but not including the highest derivative in each variable. So my vector of unknowns will be x, x prime, x double prime, y, and y prime. I have five components. After that, everything follows kind of automatically. u1 prime is x prime, that's u2. u2 prime is x prime prime, that's u3. u3 prime is x triple prime, but from the first equation, that's 2 minus xy prime, and we call that u1, u5. u4 prime is y prime, that's u5. And u5 prime is y double prime, that comes from the second ODE, that's negative e to the x. But x is u1. So there's a system of five equations in five variables, or one five-dimensional equation. Now that I started with a third-order equation and a second-order equation, 3 plus 2 equals 5. That's not a coincidence. The equation we're most interested in is this one, x double prime plus bx prime plus cx is a function of t. So this equation is second order, it's linear, and it has constant coefficients. This is the problem we can say the most about. If we do our conversion, the components of u are x and x prime. u1 prime is x prime, that's u2. u2 prime is x double prime, which we get from the ODE, so that's f of t minus b times x prime, but we called that u2, minus c times x, we called that u1. And this is a linear system of equations in u, so we can write it in matrix form. We have this matrix, it's called a companion matrix, times u, and then we have a forcing function. So mathematically, there's nothing new here. You already know everything you require. It's a first order linear system of two variables, or in two dimensions, with constant coefficients. But the applications of this second order problem are so important that we're going to write out exactly what the first order stuff means in the context of the second order equation so that we can understand it better.